Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Reed. I am with Catalyst Connection, and uh, I help to manage the AIM Hire Consortium program. And I'm going to talk to you just a couple of minutes about that. Um, but my main reason to uh, speak to you all today is to present the AIM to Learn um, series. And today we are speaking on employing AR and VR in manufacturing. And so in just a minute, I'm going to turn this over to today's speaker, um, Arif Sharon Terlici. Uh, he is with Robert Morris University, and uh, he's uh, very much involved. He's a professor with uh, engineering and manufacturing and engineering. And so he's gonna speak on this topic for about 30 minutes. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, most of you are listening to this as a recording. If you have any questions, he will uh, identify how you can reach out to him or you can reach out through the AIM Hire Consortium website. So just to give you a little bit, if you aren't familiar with our program, I'm going to give you just a little bit of uh, information um, and then we'll turn it over to today's topic. So what is the AIM Hire Consortium? Um, this is a Department of Defense OLDCC funded program that you can see supports uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, those counties in yellow, and then the entire state of West Virginia. And so those are all the counties that are um, in blue. So this is a, you know, a regional effort. And the goal is to strengthen and expand the Department of Defense supply chain. So um, we are looking at ways uh, that manufacturers can adopt advanced manufacturing technologies and uh, learn about new opportunities um, in this supply chain. Uh, as far as who is a part of that, you can see we have several partners here under economic and workforce development. I mentioned I am with Catalyst Connection. We have Innovation Works, CTC, New Century Careers, JARI, RCBI, Into Market. Um, under our Technology Institutes, we have America Makes and the ARM Institute. And then our universities, Carnegie Mellon University, um, Pitt, Robert Morris University, and WVU. Um, are all involved in helping manufacturers um, throughout this region. At the aimhiresconsortium.org website, um, you can learn all of this information. Um, you may have come there to uh, get to this recording, but make sure you also stop and see our supplier capabilities database. This is a place where you can sort and look by a manufacturer or types of products made, as well as uh, economic development organizations and partners um, through the consortium that are available to help you. So we are in the midst, this is a three-year program. Uh, we are uh, hoping for it to be sustainable beyond the three years, but as a part of our initial three years, we are in uh, the third year. Um, so we are in kind of our final uh, eight to, to 10 months of the program. And um, we are already starting to collect our regional impact. And you can see here, $16.7 million um, of investment have been made to date, uh, 76.2 million in new and retained sales and 370 jobs have been created and retained. And that is by in large part, small and medium-sized manufacturers within um, the region that I showed you, and they are just starting to show their impacts. Um, historically, these types of impacts continue exponentially as we go. And you know, how do we measure this? These are companies that have engaged with the program in a variety of ways. And one of the um, key ways is we offer um, a mini grant um, to help a company do technical assistance um, to engage in um, new technologies, robotics, automation, um, ERP, all of those kinds of things. And so when a company does a project like this, they agree to give us um, to do uh, three annual surveys on impact. And so that's these are the kind of numbers that they're giving us. And that's just starting to come in. We expect this to go much to see even bigger impact um, in the next couple of years following the initial run of the program. 
Um, I just also wanted to invite you to our next webinar, our Aim to Learn series. It's on February 9th. It's, uh, the title of it is Reality Versus Hype. Is the Advanced Analytics and AI Train Worth the Ride? Uh, so we have representatives from Delta Bravo uh, speaking. So I encourage you to join us live or watch for that recording that will be at some date following the February 9th date. All right, well, with that, I am going to, I'd like to welcome Arif uh, to uh, have, him, have him speak to us today. We're gonna turn the screen over to him, give us just a second to make that adjustment. And Arif, thank you for joining us today and speaking to us on employing AR, VR um, in manufacturing. And look, I see you're getting the screen up and it looks like it's all full screen and ready to go. Thank you, Tom, Amy, for uh, helping facilitate this uh, webinar. My, uh, just like uh, Tom said, uh, my name is Arif Shirin Talibchi. I'm a professor at Robert Morris University. And I will present uh, on uh, employing multiple realities, uh, mainly AR and VR, uh, in manufacturing. So this is the content of my presentation. Uh, I will start with definition of AR, VR, and uh, mixed and hybrid reality, as well as virtual simulation, adding more information to these uh, small background on origins, what type of tools use hardware and software, and the applications. I have a small section on comparing and contrasting extended reality hardware. And again, the word extended reality is basically about, you know, uh, stretching the uh, reality uh, by using different means. So that's where the extended reality is coming from. Uh, I'll be using different terms and I'll try to uh, define them as we go along. Uh, I have a separate section on industrial applications, and we will, uh, you know, uh, uh, end with conclusions and future directions, some on technical aspects, uh, technology, others may be on ethically. So if you look at the uh, mixed reality spectrum, uh, you know, on the very left, you see the real environment. So the, that's the world we live in, real environment then we can start imposing things to the real world, like the Pokemon Go game, you know, exposing some of the, you know, parts of our real world by augmenting features to it. So super overlaying, superimposing. Then we can move towards the, uh, you know, more virtual worlds with uh, virtual reality or augmented virtuality. And then there is the whole virtual world. I will try to cover, uh, again, the three out of the four, and you know about the real environment. So the, uh, the, the first thing I'm gonna be talking on is the virtual simulation before I get to AR and VR. Assume that you have a fully developed digital factory modeled after its physical self or they use the term twin these days. So you can, uh, you know, design a whole digital factory or design a factory in digital uh, environments and have actually physical and digital factory even interact. So this digital factory will have machines, material handling me mechanisms, storage areas, even the digital humans or workers in it. We call them digital mannequins. And it may be running aut autonomously based on certain simulation scenarios. Now, in terms of uh, uh, how to interact with this digital uh, environment or virtual environment, uh, it, 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 uh, by using sensing, uh, we are able to interfere with this digital uh, world, and uh, we can basically uh, immerse into it. So uh, that'll be. Uh, virtual reality. Another name for virtual reality 
is augmented virtuality, even though it's not commonly used, but we are actually augmenting the virtual world with our ourselves. So that's why it's actually, it is augmented virtuality, but again, we are using the term virtual reality in its place. Now, in terms of the augmented reality, we basically, uh, uh, if we move from virtual world, we augment ourselves to it. Then, then the next step may be, you know, the, adding the virtual or digital components to enrich the uh, real world to accomplish a task or uh, get more benefits out of the real world. Uh, we have to use augmented reality. So I'm going to define and talk about each component uh, I mentioned in this slide. Uh, again, gradually uh, explain uh, different things to you. So one of the tools I have used over the years is the Dalmia software. And this software can be used in designing a whole digital factory, including its machines, its uh, furniture, its uh, material handling systems, as well as workers. Uh, I use the term digital mannequins. Uh, so the Dalmia software has been migrated to a cloud-based tool by the VDS company. Uh, that, that tool is called 3D Experience. And there are other tools attached to the 3D experience. Again, it's a cloud-based tool. In the past, it was running on CATIA, the CAT program CATIA, and it was able to do many different things. You know, you could uh, design your products uh, using, you know, finite element analysis or uh, turn them into your designs into virtual prototypes. Uh, you could uh, do discrete event simulation uh, analysis within the tool to see how the, your products are flowing within the plant or the factory. Or basically you were programming a welding robot. Now I have done spot welding uh, programs in this tool uh, with uh, or four ABV robots. And these are some of the capabilities of a virtual simulation tool. And again, the environment is totally virtual. And there are some examples here you can see um, uh, that a robot is actually working on car assembly here. And again, you can generate comprehensive models and tie them to all sorts of analyses, uh, as well as, uh, you know, computer-aided manufacturing features like the robot programming, CNCs, things like that. And you can see the Dalmia human mod module on the side, and you can, besides the robots working on uh, processes, in this case, it's the assembly, the humans, human models, digital, you know, copies of humans or digital mannequins can also be used in the work. Uh, we can do time studies. We can figure out how long uh, certain things going to take uh, without using even stopwatches. You can also see that we can interact with this virtual environment. That individual basically controlling. Now we are gradually moving from virtual simulation and autonomously uh, running a digital factory model, again, including the humans, into more of a virtual reality type of system. You can see that the individual is actually uh, controlling the digital mannequin here. So gradually we are leaving virtual simulation, we are uh, going towards virtual reality, since this individual is immersed within the virtual model and also able to you know, impact or interfere with the uh, virtual model. Again, uh, if you remember the spectrum, you, uh, at the very right is the virtual world, and we're slowly shifting towards the left from virtual simulation to virtual reality. A few more examples on virtual simulation, uh, you know, uh, besides uh, tools like Dalmia or Siemens as a sim uh, similar PLM tool, uh, uh, companies like FANIC or ABB has, you know, lesser, uh, less comprehensive tools. Uh, you can do offline robot programming uh, and a little bit more. Uh, I use uh, components like Handling Pro for material handling, Pellet Pro for pelletizing, and then uh, uh, paint, paint Pro for spray painting, things like that. So uh, two of the exercises I have done with my students are uh, on the slide. Uh, again, these are offline programming tools, so it's a subset of uh, virtual simulation tools and the program generated. Again, 
a comprehensive virtual simulation tool can have uh, offline programming ability as well. So that's what I have done with uh, spot welding programming. So before I get to virtual reality, I'm going to talk about augmented reality because, uh, again, uh, po Pokemon Go game was so you know popular a few years ago. So probably uh, almost everybody has seen what Pokemon Go is about uh, or, or even played or exposed to it. Basically, uh, in the case of augmented reality, and again, this is very close to the real world, we're trying to enhance the uh, re real world view of the user, basically by superimposing or overlaying you know, all sorts of information. It could be alphanumeric, it could be graphical. Uh, basically, the goal is to enhance the uh, user's uh, real life view of the world, real world. So there are different forms of augmented reality applications. And one of them will be a uh, one of them will be using a target image or a marker. You will see these uh, in a little bit. Uh, and uh, usually, uh, when the camera of the smart device we are using or the computer, uh, if it sees this marker or image, a predetermined shape, it can bring up all all sorts of information and that could be a you know three dimensional graphics so you'll see from my examples and we call that reference image target image or marker and again it has to be seen by the you know the ar applications camera once the the software identifies that target image is there the additional information is pulled up and basically overlaid uh, or superimposed on the real world view now you can add animations uh, to your AR applications. So basically, uh, after seeing the target image, the image, uh, the software can pull up an animated 3D image. So basically, uh, this will be moving. Uh, you'll be moving in a predetermined, uh, using predetermined uh, set of motions. That could be generated in SolidWorks, for example, that could be a motion study from SolidWorks, uh, but there is no interaction possible. In the third kind of augmented reality, you can add the control script. Basically, you can have different animations controlled by different, you know, keystrokes. You, you can use joysticks, you can use different keys. So you can pull up an animated image, uh, again, and different animations are possible using different, you know, keystrokes or in interference from the user. There is also the uh, AR applications being done without target images. Uh, we call these uh, markerless. And again, uh, something like the Pokemon Go in reality is a, is a markerless uh, application. There are different ways of doing this including uh, using location and you know points of interest and things like that so uh, this doesn't uh, include a, a predetermined marker so a few examples of augmented reality uh, i have included some of the simpler ones and we will discuss uh, what else are being done by some of the major companies uh, in the coming slides uh, so uh, but before I get to my examples, let me still introduce you uh, some applications. So uh, the, this can be used in product and machine design, uh, design feasibility, especially simulation and design analyses, uh, safety uh, area, especially the hazard analyses, and again, training for all sorts of things. That can include maintenance and safety. Now, uh, the couple of examples uh, given in the slide here. One of them is this uh, simple AR app that you can see the target image uh, when the camera of the phone recognizes the target image immediately gives the, you know, use instructions for the vertical bandsaw. And you can add safety features to this as well. The other example is a three dimensional parts catalog. And again, this type of thing is very common. Uh, the goal here was uh, you know, uh, again, the first one is a very simple AI application. It's a target image and no animations, no interaction. 
interactivity included. Uh, the second one has both animations and uh, interactivity included. You can see the virtual rotate button there. So basically when the camera sees different parts in this one AI application, from a 2D image, it can pull the 3D image of the cat uh, of the cat mile file of the part, and it can also, you know, enhance additional uh, enhance the you know view with additional information, dimensions, tolerances, things like that. Again, this is just a fastener here, but uh, so this app can identify so many different parts. So it's uh, we calling it a 3D uh, uh, digital parts catalog. And all of uh, both of these are done at Robert Morris and uh, simple post projects. So, in terms of the history of augmented reality, naturally, uh, the, uh, uh, it is originated in the early 1900s uh, about targeting mechanisms. Then uh, uh, you saw the same type of thing being applied to, you know, military fighter aircraft and helicopters. Uh, You'll see head up displays and uh, things like that. And uh, the, the development finally uh, shifted uh, into gaming industry and industrial applications. Uh, and uh, the last few years, we have seen a lot of uh, attempts on employing this in manufacturing. Now, I have uh, three different definitions here in terms of since the displays are involved with the AR system, so you have to somehow, you know, overlay, superimpose the information uh, onto the uh, user's uh, real life view. It could be a pilot, it could be a worker at a factory. So uh, three definitions are uh, critical uh, to mention here. Uh, presenting a single image to a single eye, that's what we call monocular. Single image to both eyes, we call it biocular and uh, separate viewpoint corrected images to each eye. We call it binocular. Uh, having said that, so I'll refer to some of these things later on. I have slides that you can use as a reference uh, as we compare some of these, you know, tools, uh, extended reality tools. Now, uh, AR devices are of two category uh, based on their optics. One of them are, uh, is see-through displays. And you can see that the pilots, uh, wiser uh, is see through it can still see the real world uh, it also has things being overlaid okay see through displays and a similar device uh, today uh, popular or not is the hololens microsoft's hololens uh, is uh, it's uh, you know common uh, ar tool and uh, the second type of ar display will be the um, the video displays uh, if you take a look at the bottom figure, the right side, and that's Oculus Quest 2, Oculus Quest 2, and it's the first AR type of Oculus devices, and it has a little camera in the front, uh, so you can actually see the, you know, the real uh, world view using that camera, unlike the wiser, the first type here, and all of that will be still displayed on a, you know, the monitor on a screen that you will see on a display. So naturally, uh, that may generate some issues with uh, in terms of people's vision and the perception uh, through those devices. So recently, we have looked at you know uh, what type of AR glasses are popular or you know, being uh, valued. Uh, so these are ranked from top to bottom uh, using the software testing cap.com. And again, my goal was to introduce the devices here as well, that anybody wants to do this type of thing, uh, you will see what's out there. Now, in terms of our experience, we have both Oculus Quest 2 and HoloLens 2, and we are developing some AR applications. Uh, for example, if you search for Oculus Quest 2 applications, you're gonna see very limited AR resources uh, on that because it's fairly new. Oculus Quest 1 only had VR ability. In terms of the software for development, if you want to do your own development, uh, major game engines are good for this type of work, Unity uh, Editor or the Unreal Game Engine, again, for XR. So you can do both AR and VR in both of these. 
uh, devices. And in the past, I have used Unity Editor with Vuforia, uh, Vuforia being the plugin. Now, Vuforia uh, had their own software. I continue to use Unity Editor. There is no, uh, you know, I'm familiar with it. Uh, I used to write computer games uh, for classes with students. So uh, I didn't have to, you know, shift or move uh, to. Uh, away from a known tool. That's why I, I select Unity Editor. Uh, other tools like AR Core. And again, there are tools out there that can make this process simpler. And uh, cost may be higher to companies compared to universities. Uh, Apple has a you know, good number of tools available here. And uh, you know some of which are easy to use. Uh, again, the drag and drop is uh, mentioned here. Uh, but uh, you know, some of these are really uh, uh, worth to try, at least, if you want to develop some AR application. Now, uh, let's uh, switch uh, uh, to virtual reality or augmented virtuality. Again, AR is about you know, impose, uh, superimposing the uh, you know, digital images, virtual, virtual, the virtual components onto the real world. In the case of VR, we do the opposite. So we try to immerse the real things into uh, into a virtual world. And you can see that you know an engineer or a worker in reality uh, through the VR glasses can be immersed and maybe conducting a process, maybe disassembling uh, you know parts, inspecting something. So uh, again. Uh, you can quickly move from VS, VS environment, virtual simulation environment to virtual reality. I'll give more examples, uh, but uh, this is one good example. And in terms of the development, again, the military uh, dominated the early years, and then it switched to, you know, entertainment again, uh, and that uh, technical applications now is uh, basically they're exploding. In terms of the, uh, you know, the, the main idea of uh, or main concept of VR is that you're trying to, if you're going to use a virtual tool, the, basically the VR interface uh, make you, you know, immerse or belong to this virtual environment. And you can see that I purposely left the size of the original, you know, VR glasses used by, uh, uh, by the Air Force. Uh, U.S. Air Force, there you can, it's probably an extremely heavy device. Uh, anyway, let's move on to uh, the, the tools available for VR. In terms of the software, again, you can use Unity Editor and Unreal Game Engine. I have used the Amazon Web Services. Unfortunately, this is being discontinued, and Babylon JS is kind of replacing that. I have done some VR presentations. So you can use these tools to generate interactive VR environments as well, but I have done some VR presentations. So you can see that I can pull in a, you know, I use the term digital mannequin. You also know the term avatar. So you can put in your avatar and prepare maybe a PowerPoint presentation and your avatar will present that. Again, if you are contacted, I can share uh, more details about any of the tools. And I wanted to use some low-cost tools, and we have a few Nintendo Switches laying around at the school. Uh, again, we do game development. So the earlier versions of this uh, Labo, Labo kit, basically, it comes with a cardboard, um, you know, VR glasses and some discs and some other tools. Basically, we have used them uh to develop VR tools like a manufacturing game and things like that but uh, you can see some of the examples some of the things uh, we work with or we produced and uh, again uh, the local stuff uh, but you still have to have a Nintendo switch controller to able to accomplish this uh, we also 3d printed some tools uh, besides the glasses you can put the game controllers into 3d printed tools and they can just interact with what you design and they, only the Toycon Garage 04 module of the lab of kids had the VR, you know, game development or VR development ability. Had the VR development ability. Uh, you know, HMD is like a helmet mounted devices like Oculus Go, Quest, or Quest 1 and 2 are common VR tools. 
we also look at uh, what other tools out there and uh, which ones are ranked the best. And again, uh, this is uh, from the point of uh, game uh, from the point of gamers. And again, they use these devices a lot. Uh, so uh, they ranked Oculus Quest 2 as number one and uh, HTC's Wire Cosmos Elite as number five. You can see the rankings there. And again, it's all uh, about the game performance, but they can be trans translated to technical users. Now, uh, in terms of the uh, VR tools, uh, there are two other VR, uh, VR tools. I can talk about it. Uh, one of them is the Virtusphere. Uh, the cover slide of this presentation is an example of the Virtusphere. Basically, think about yourself uh, as a, you know, the small animal in a, you know, cage, and you're running, a, you know, running at this. So guess what? Virtusphere sphere is similar to that, and actually, the VR user can stay in Virtusphere and uh, can cover a lot of distances as it, it, he or she interacts with the environment. Another uh, way of uh, generating immersive environment is for VR purposes is the uh, uh, 360 projection. And sometimes we use the term CAVE. CAVE is short for Computer Assisted Virtual Environment or Computer Augmented Virtual Environment, even though it's a uh, you know, virtual reality environment, it's not augmented reality. So you can. Uh, employ some of these methods if you have to uh you know uh, deal with some large scale systems and i'll give you examples in a little bit and i already talked about the cardboard uh, level systems and uh, i'm not sure how accessible they are but uh, uh, if you have access to it uh, you know um, we can also help you with that we have conference papers and you know book chapters and things like that uh, associated with the, with this type of work now, uh, in terms of comparing and contrasting XR hardware, uh, so Oculus 2, Oculus Quest 2, sorry, has a six gigabyte RAM with a storage capacity of 120 gigabytes or 256 gigabytes, uh, while the HoloLens has four gig RAM with a storage capacity of 64 gigabytes. And again, uh, you, uh, you can look at the RAM, storage capability, things like that, in terms of the cost, one of them is a few hundred dollars, like Oculus Quest is uh, reasonable for purchase, while the HoloLens 2 uh, was about like $3,500. So the five, 600 versus 3,500, that type of thing in terms of their scale. You, we cannot, you know, again, I cannot compare all of these tools using all these different factors involved, but I have a few slides here for your reference so you can uh, look at uh, these things to see what type of factors we can actually use to compare different devices. Actually, the optics or the use of comfort is one of the biggest things. And then I, I uh, uh, redefine the, the ocularity modes and their displays and the advantages and disadvantages uh, in the area in a different slide. So I'm not going to cover that as well. Let's uh, let's go into the industrial applications. So Ford has used uh, you know XR in uh, exploring vehicle design on on both the exterior and interior side, uh, basically to look over the structure and how various systems interact with each other. So again, the design feasibility is a good uh, you know term to define what they did. And you will also see the term virtual manufacturing. So anytime you're assembling something in the in, in the virtual world, again, you're actually doing virtual manufacturing uh, or looking at the design, modifying the design, disassembling it, things like that. Now, uh, they also use the uh, this type of uh, effort in uh, safety. And they actually, uh, According to references, they decrease the uh, you know the injury rates by seventy percent. Now another thing about Ford is that uh, the Mustang, the electric Mustang Mach E, uh, is basically electric uh, you know electric uh, car vehicle, a uh, whole lot of batteries. So the batteries has to be serviced and maintained. And guess what? They are training 
they are, uh, you know, technicians, service technicians using the VR tools, and they believe uh, it's going to save them a lot of time and money. Uh, help with the service and the maintenance, the outcomes of the uh, processes. You're looking at another example. Uh, this is uh, Lockheed Martin's work for NASA's Orion device. If you take a look at Orion's, uh, you know, cable uh, harness uh, fasteners, there are, I think it's 57,000 of them. 57,000, hopefully I'm not wrong there, of fasteners are being used. And rather than, for example, spending an eight hour time for doing certain things, uh, they, they were what cut the process time to 40%, maybe 90% in some processes. And uh, they increase the overall productivity, again, using AR uh, by 40%. And you can see that uh, the worker uh, is, work, uh, worker is uh, you know, uh, working on the assembly using AR glasses, yeah. So, uh, and they use that not only in the, you know, the manufacturing side, but also design side as well. Another example will be uh, education and training. You're going to see many more examples on educational applications or, or training. Uh, there is the Vertex 360 valve simulator as by Lincoln Electric. Now, the system itself is very expensive. I believe uh, tens of thousands of dollars. You can see that the folks are being trained. So if we, if you don't have the interface with the hardware, naturally uh, you may keep the cost less and actually you can make a uh, training more efficient uh, and less expensive as well. Uh, but these folks claim that uh, rather than doing so many tech welds, you may have to do one or two just to get trained in some sort of welding. These type of things can be applied to like other processes, including like spray painting, if you're manually spray painting things. And... They went the wrong way. Now, in terms of uh, what to expect in the future, and actually the applications are growing uh, by the minute. And the a lot of uses in automotive and aerospace industries that includes also defense as well. We're trying to conserve materials, save time, uh, lead time of development, uh, lead time of manufacturing, uh, trying to generate a safer workplace. And naturally, the education and training side will see a lot of applications. We talked about welding training. Uh, you know, this can be applied to anything. Design advisor for design advisor for assembly operations, for example, not only for welding. Carnegie Mellon, I believe, is uh, doing some work in that for the digital and in. And again, all of this uh, will definitely have uh, if we can overcome that, you know, the, overcome the burden of the initial investment. And again, there are a lot of tools. Yeah. You can utilize uh, lower cost tools and you can find the means to do a lot of good stuff using uh, lesser uh, resources. Uh, there is going to be a lot of technical uh, developments. You know, DARPA is looking at corrective lenses, contact lenses being used as glasses, uh, use of 3D sound. You know, again, a lot of these uh, may be sounding much. Uh, fancier for gamers and things like that, but the, uh, the use of sound, the use of you know different you know optical tools and stuff like that, including holograms. We, we, we may see more holograms, for example, looking into uh, you may see them in sci tech shows and movies and things like that, but we will see more holograms uh, designed in different ways. Now I have a I have a simple hologram example here. This is a, the looking glass. And again, we were just looking into that. You can see the video showing the astronaut walking. Uh, again, this is a three-dimensional display. And uh, not, it's not that cheap, but it's not very expensive either. So you'll see more 3D uh, displays and you will see uh, interfacing with you know like cave you know uh, making interfacing easy 
and you don't need to pair glasses and things like that. You can also see on the right side, one of my students actually embedded the SolidWorks model into uh, looking glass and using the leak motion sensor and the bottom figure uh, showing the, you know, the program uh, used, the basic logic used. So the, you can turn these objects. And again, I was trying to do these things uh, uh, just simply with Unity uh, game engine and reporting on the facts. And I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, if there are any questions, you can contact me at my last name is rmu.ed or through the AIM Higher Consortium and uh, through uh, uh, Mr. Reed, Mr. Tom. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Arif. Thank you. Um, this was great. Um, and I just, I, like you said, I would encourage anyone who has questions or would like to learn more, uh, you can go to aimhireconsortium.org and there are uh, forms you can fill out and other contact information. Uh, to reach out to any of the partners that we have. And uh, if you talk to any one of us, we will engage you with all of the right people to help you. And certainly um, um, Arif, Arif would be uh, a part of that discussion um, if it's in the AR, VR uh, world. I know we have a lot of small, medium-sized manufacturers um, who we're working with. And um, and I think to your point, the, I think you kind of, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is becoming more available and more affordable um, as we go. And there are a lot of local partners here who can maybe help a company who may think that they don't have the resources to buy uh, a lot of this and in, in keep it for themselves, but there are partners you could work with um, who can help you get started or maybe help you to use some of the their equipment without you having to purchase everything yourself. So um, yeah, so reach out to us and we'll be glad to have that discussion with you. And there is uh, potentially some grant funding to help as well uh, with these kinds of projects. So uh, again, uh, thank you for your time and um, we hope to see you again on a future Aim to Learn series. Take care.